Hi, I'm Othias, and this, ooh, this is the Japanese Type 30, an original Arisaka rifle, and the Empire of Japan's first smokeless. Let's go ahead and see if we can squeeze it down in the light box. With an overall length of 50.2 inches and weighing in at 8.7 pounds, this is an old world bolt action rifle. Has a magazine capacity of five rounds of 6.5 by 50 millimeter, uh, early small bore cartridge, and it feeds from a stripper clip. Its most distinguishing characteristic is of course its hook-like safety. Before we get started, I'd just like to say that we've had a number of commenters lately who have been kindly expressing their appreciation that CNR Simul manages to do long-form, in-depth firearm history every other week. Some are flabbergasted, we even pull it off. Well, I'd just like to once again thank our patrons. Without their frankly altruistic support, we couldn't provide everyone with the free history lessons. So if you get a second, thank a patron. Or if you can afford it, become one. It's literally a dollar. Now, some of you are likely suffering from deja vu because we've covered the Type 30 way, way back in the ancient year of 2016. Ah yes, our lighting was variable, the audio was acceptable, and the episodes were shorter. And my glasses were... creepier. Well, to be honest, we can do just a little bit better these days, and we have access to some extra pieces to better tell the history of this particular firearm. So waste not, want not. Which of course, the history begins with a review of the precursor design. The Murata, in this case, the Type 22, descending from a big bore single shot, this was actually almost a modern rifle. We're not gonna do a whole Murata history in this episode, but it had begun as a single shot large bore black powder rifle. At its inception, the Japanese Murata was a hybridization of several European designs, and throughout its evolution, we saw the same. The Type 22 bolt action embodied features from the French Gras, Dutch Boma, and sported a Kropacek style tubular magazine. It also chambered a small bore 8mm cartridge, all fairly advanced for its time, except it was still black powder, which made it one of the last of its kind adopted in 1889. This was when most nations were scrambling for smokeless. This limitation, among others, would reveal itself during the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894 and 1895. For the largest part of this conflict, the Japanese forces would be far better equipped than their Chinese opponents. However, on occasion they would come up against more modern rifles, particularly the German Gewehr 1888 Commission Rifle. This had been licensed for production by China in 1891. Manufacture wouldn't begin until late 1895 after the war with Japan. However, it's likely German-made examples were already purchased. There was no way Japan was going to field a clearly inferior rifle against the Chinese, so a rifle commission was assembled. This would be headed by then Lieutenant Colonel Nariakira Arisaka. Born April 5th, 1852 in Iwakuni, Kibe Nariakira was the son of a Choshu Samurai. In 1862, he would be adopted by a gunner, Arisaka Nagara, taking on his family name. Now, just to be clear, this was a time of great change in Japan, uh, ultimately resulting in the Meiji Restoration, which in turn kicked off rapid modernization across the country, and in particular, the military fields. In 1870, Arisaka would enter the Army Military Academy, and by 1890, he became an Army Artillery Captain. His specialty was coastal fortifications. From there, he became involved in the development of field guns and caught the eye of Tsuneyoshi Murata himself, supposedly receiving the man's personal endorsement. By 1895, Arisaka had risen to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and was placed in charge of a commission seeking a new smokeless repeating rifle for the Imperial Japanese Army. Presiding over the commission meant that Nariakira Arisaka would have the strongest influence on Japan's final design, but it also means he wasn't alone in the credit. I've heard reference to a Lieutenant Colonel Miata and a civilian engineer known only as Mr. Hanjo. I'm unsure of their backgrounds or their final input. I've just heard their names in sort of the literature. Now, the actual work of the rifle began in December of 1895 in the small arms section of the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of insight into which rifles were reviewed or how they were assessed. However, looking at the Type 30 itself, we can see a number of influential designs. 
It is my belief that it is mostly based off the Mauser's 1893 and 1895 and the Dutch style Monlicker of 1895, plus a little tinkering of the Swiss Schmidt Rubin sorta. If this seems like a weird combination, don't worry, I'll walk you through it in a moment. We'll start, of course, with the cartridge though. The Japanese commission opted for the then very advanced 6.5 small bore high speed jacketed bullet. This was especially marketed by OEWG Steyr in Austria, and we'll see their influence in the Italian Carcano and both the Romanian and Dutch Monlickers. These all used somewhat different case lengths and powder loads, as did the Japanese version here, but all were looking to achieve a long range, flat shooting, lightly recoiling, and lightweight cartridge. The big difference from Japan was the use of a semi-rim case instead of the Steyr rim or Mauser rimless. Now, my claim of the Japanese reviewing the Steyr rifles isn't just based on the cartridge. At this time in the, in the international small arms market, the biggest two competitors were Mauser in Germany and OEWG Steyr in Austria. If Japan was asking about military rifles, they were bound to be offered samples from these two. And their big export pattern guns were, well, they were the Mauser, and the Monlicker. The then current Mauser 1893 pattern would spread around the world with minor modifications, resulting in the Swedish 1894 and 1896, the slightly upgraded model of 1895, and others. Steyr's Monlicker branded derivations of the German Gewehr 88 would see service in Romania in two patterns. A variant would also serve with the Dutch starting in 1895, and as late as 1903, one with a new rotary magazine was adopted by Greece. We've covered all of these on our show before. Now, in order to understand what I mean, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at our rifle a bit earlier than usual. Now, when I say this rifle is related to the Mauser 1893, I can back that up because if we get a general look at both, they have very similar layouts. So if I lower this guy down, yeah, okay, there's no finger rest here. There is here that could have been borrowed from elsewhere, although we do see finger rests in some Mausers of this pattern. If we come further down, we have a similar lower barrel band that's still fairly far ahead of the action and half length upper handguard. If we come on down further, we see that, actually without going too far, we borrowed a spring and band versus a clamping band from the Spanish. This again is an option on some uh, Mauser exports and even Monlickers, so could have come from either side of the family. And then this is gonna get a little tricky with balancing the rifles, but if we get to the end, we really see the family resemblance because both of these guns are set up with extremely similar front ends with technically driftable front sights, although this would be at an armor level. And of course, let me get that a little bit lower. There we go. Uh, they would have both had uh, cleaning rods. This one's sadly missing, although it would have been a brass tip. They both have extremely similar bayonet lug systems. And of course, the way the front sight is collared on here kind of resembles the step down for the Spanish 93. Again, the Spanish 93 doesn't represent all 93 and 95 pattern Mausers, but the lineage is certainly there. If we get to the rear, we see one other key difference, which is that ooh, 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 one is a straight wrist, while the other ooh, semi pistol grip may will be very happy about that feature. Now, both guns are using flush, staggered five round box magazines. Both of these rifles also use, oh, let me get this out of the way, a bit hard to do this dance, stripper clips, five rounds each, same system coming from the Monlicker, you would have had an end block, the Mauser stripper clip. Now, they both have interrupting followers, so you can't bolt forward on empty. Again, Mauser family of rifles. And if we go ahead and start to get this closed, and go ahead and start to get that closed. You notice at some point we hit some resistance. It's fairly different on both guns, but what's happening is they're cock on closed. So if I start to pull this bolt forward, you'll see the cocking piece back there, cocking away. I can't drop it because the other rifle's in the way. Same thing here, cocking piece extending, cock on close. Another feature that I can't show you at the moment on the Mauser is that on a 95 Mauser, we would have had a metal extension here with a little rise that would sit behind the root of the bolt handle and act as an additional safety locking surface. The Arisaka has just that, which would have been on a 95 Mauser, although very low. It would have been all of a quarter inch tall. In this case, they went way up and over. This provides a little extra leverage. Let me get that out of the way. A little extra leverage as we cock close 
we can turn early into this path and it provides us some leveraging force to help further cock that last little bit of the gun. See it coming forward as we turn the corner? That is a nice little mechanical aid. Barring a Dutch 1895 Indonesian pattern rifle, we'll be able to see some of the Monlicker influences. So here's our bolt release on this particular gun. Push in, withdraw. Let me get this out of our way. And on the Japanese, push in, withdraw. Take special note of the nice serrations on that. They will be different later. Comparing the three bolts with the Arisaka in the middle, it's definitely favoring the sort of Dutch pattern Monlicker in the sense that, now let's get this on up, and this on up and that on up. Let's look at the bolt head for a second. This is integral with the bolt body, huge extractor, very reliable for preventing double feed, something that we'll talk about later. Uh, let's get this guy aside and look at the Monlicker guns, because for sure, we've got very similar systems. We have an extractor over the side, although it's been buffed up much more than sort of the Dutch pattern of uh, Monlicker. It's a little bit almost like it's halfway between this guy and that guy. Now, uh, we have an ejector on the side that would hit the bolt stop and then pop forward, so that's also very similar. And we have fixed non-rotating bolt faces that are flush. I'm not sure how easy that is on the camera. At the rear, however, things get entirely different. This Gewehr 88 style of cocking piece and rotating safety borrowed from the earlier Mauser rifles that then followed into the Monlicker rifles, yeah, that's nothing like what we're seeing over here on the Arisaka. As a matter of fact, the way this guy works is actually much closer to that Schmidt Rubin of 1889 that we filmed previously. Pull it out and then rotate. Uh, you know what, I have to put this back into the gun to show it. So while it's not a ring like the Swiss gun, we can pull this back, rotate it 90 degrees and let it forward. In this position, it blocks us from seeing the rear sight and it means that the gun is essentially decocked with the firing pin turned into a channel, well, held back by a lug rather than a channel, which prevents it from being able to reach the actual primer of the cartridge. Pull back and turn to recock and you're back in business. The rear sight on this gun can't actually be attributed to either the Mauser or the Monlicker because both made use of ladder sights in various configurations. On the Japanese gun, it's set for 300 meter zero. There is no tangent rise at all. If you want to do any ranged fire, you must flip the ladder all the way up, which of course is hard to see in this view, so I'll leave it down for a moment. And then we can adjust the slider all the way up to a potential, well, I mean, technically I think the slider only goes up to 1900 meters, and then that center notch there is for 2000. So an ambitious uh, range for sure. Now, not only did the Arisaka not opt to adopt the stepped barrel of the Mauser, they actually went with their own uniquely Japanese solution, as far as I can tell, which is to have a dampening ring at about the midpoint of the barrel, hoping to soak up some of that resonance. You can find it, of course, under this barrel band, which again, nice and spring tensioned, easy on, easy off. Although I'm gonna tell you, sometimes a little too easy off. Other uniquely Japanese features include the addition of these gas vent holes in case of a ruptured well, case. And then, oh, look, one for the bolt as well. That would hopefully shunt out anything that came down the firing pin channel. But look, another bleed hole here on the bolt face. So they were very cognizant of the possibility of ruptured cases. This, of course, was a bigger problem when using a essentially rimless cartridge. Uh, a properly rim cartridge acts as a very good gas check just in and of itself, which is why you don't tend to see sort of a gas mitigation system built into something like the Lee Enfield. Now, like a Mauser, the floor plate is removable, but instead of having to put the tip of a projectile in there and wiggle about, you just have to press this button and then boom, the floor plate hinges down and then releases all the way. Also unique to this gun was the use of a wire coil spring instead of a flat spring in order to power that magazine. I'm sure this had to do with the ease of them making that wire versus trying to work up a flat spring. Now let's talk some more about the uniqueness of the Japanese bolt. It's sort of similar, especially at the front end to the Monlicker in the sense that we can just turn and wiggle and boom, we've got our bolt head out. This then has the extractor component and the ejector, which is actually floated in there. Oh God, always easier to do off camera than on, isn't it folks? There we go. And then, that's, you know, okay, fairly simple. A bit to lose if you're trying to take it apart in the field, but fairly simple. 
And then we have to deal with taking this guy apart, which gets a little wild. Uh, let me do some camera work. At the back of the bolt, we have, well, a textured piece that I like to call the, well, I like to call it the yokes in plural. You'll see why in a second. But there's on one side of it, a flat spring uh, with a square cut that serves as a detent. So you press that in and start to unscrew. Now, this gun kind of lies to you in the sense that you would believe that if you just kept unscrewing this, and by the way, you can fit a slotted screwdriver in there or a coin, uh, you would believe that eventually this would come out of the gun if you keep unscrewing it. But instead, we're probably just gonna hear something like a little noise in a moment. There we go, that thunk that indicates that we've freed it from the assembly and yet she's not coming out of there. There's a reason for that. That's because we must depress our whole firing pin assembly deeper than we possibly can in order to free well, that safety mechanism and, yeah, that guy's holding on real tight right now. You can't get this sort of puzzle box out of your way without using a separate tool. Now, you're supposed to just basically have the right diameter of pipe, but uh, I've found that Lee Enfield bolt head tools work perfectly for this task. They wrap around the firing pin and provide uh, just the right dimensions to be able to push this guy up and down the way we want pushing all the way down on that piece, fully extends the central firing pin, pushes this yoke all the way out of the action, and look, it falls in half. It was actually two perfectly machined pieces, and they could only be freed by both unthreading them and lifting them high enough. Now, ideally, you would push down and then unthread all this, and that way you don't put any weight on those last threads, but I really wanted you guys to see how confusing this could possibly be for someone trying to explore one of these rifles 100 years later and not knowing. From here, we can let this up and this whole assembly will come apart. Let me get you a better shot of that. There's our two yoke halves and we'll pull away our safety, and at which point we now have freed, <laughs> the firing pin managed to shoot on out under its own power, and, we have our actual caulking piece proper. Now in most of these old guns, this would represent a lot more material, but it's been sort of conjoined with this sort of safety component and this yoke, which ties them all together to form the whole sort of caulking piece assembly and the ability to decock the gun. This is fairly friggin' complicated. Now, before I go any further in this rifle, I need to remind you all that we are still in the design phase of the story. So while this is cool, it isn't yet set in stone. A trial rifle was put into production in July of 1896. Sadly, how many or what sort of trials processes they were put through, bit of a mystery. Japanese documentation is apparently scant. We do know that the trials rifle resulted in only minor changes. Uh, one's already integrated into the gun I've already shown you. The final design was ready in April of 1897 and would be adopted as the Type 30 rifle. This being, of course, the 30th year of the Meiji Imperial Era. Pre-production testing, however, revealed another problem. The stocks were easily damaged. This was because uh, Japan was largely limited to just a handful of softwoods for rifle production. Number one, Japanese beach. Japanese beach. Number two, Japanese Judas tree. Japanese Judas tree. Number three, Japanese walnut. Japanese walnut. These were all susceptible to cracking, especially at the wrist and toe. So a solution was devised. Yeah, it looks like the machinery was already set up because this is an addendum, a nice little extension down the back of the wrist. And we'll see a similar function on the other side. Yep, another little wrist extension. This of course giving you lots of extra yoke in order to prevent this guy from cracking. Another innovation for the lightweight wood can be found here at the back of the stock. Unfortunately, this stock is a horrible liar about this because there's so much grain and damage to the wood, and then there's actually been a much later toe repair on this gun that would not have been original to the rifle, so it can be kind of hard to make out. And then this is a lie, because this is a scratch. The line we're looking for 
is right about here. As a matter of fact, I can just see it off camera right there. I'm following it. Hopefully you guys can now see it at home. It's right there. What happens is the grain for this stock, the upper section of the stock is running this way. However, that was causing chipping at the toe, which still seems to have happened in the case of this gun anyway. So what they did is they wanted to have a separate piece of wood that they could put in a separate grain direction. This also has the added advantage of allowing you to cut a stock out of a smaller blank piece of wood to begin with and use up smaller pieces to finish up your guns. So they dovetailed it in, hammered it in from the rear, and then they set it in several ways. One, the butt plate has a screw here and here in order to make sure that it's secured uh, one section to the other and that it can't back out from its dovetail. And two, the leading screw on the swivel here is actually long enough to go all the way down into the second piece of wood, therefore tying them together at the front and at the rear. A very good system for making use of lighter wood, keeping very strong grain boundaries and reusing materials. Now, normally we don't do bayonets, but I happen to have one handy because the Type 30 bayonet is practically ubiquitous, thanks to it being retained all the way through World War II by Japan. It's a very long, single-edge, straight-back blade that has a hooked quillion at the front, at least in the early years. Detachable by, well, a simple Mauser-style release button. This particular blade would actually inspire the British later on. All right, with all those issues resolved, we can finally have the Type 30 rifle. So, let's take a look inside with the help of an animation. First, we'll load up our five-round stripper clip, filling up our staggered magazine. From here, we'll just manually work the bolt forward and turn it down into lock. The symmetrical locking lugs are at the front, integral to the body. The actual bolt head is separate, and non-rotating. Attached to it are the extractor and the ejector, which is of the sliding type that will strike against the bolt stop. The extractor pulls the rim of the case and the ejector strikes the bolt stop and flings it right out. Looking further inside the bolt, we can see the firing pin, which is under constant spring tension forward, but is held rearward by this cocking piece, which is in turn attached to the safety hook. Releasing the cocking piece causes the firing pin to strike the primer, discharging the rifle. As we bolt open, the cocking piece is guided back slightly. This retracts the firing pin enough for safe loading. Full cock isn't achieved until we bolt back forward, with the cocking piece catching on the sear. The trigger group is of standard Mauser configuration. The sear holds back the cocking piece with its rear constantly pivoted upwards, thanks to a coil spring at its front. The vertical pin at its front also serves as an out-of-battery safety, as it cannot rise unless a corresponding notch in the bolt is present. The sear can be lowered by pulling the trigger. This is a two-stage affair, meaning we first hit a flat, and then we go over the second hump. Blamo. This is the safety hook. Just pull, turn 90 degrees, and release. Now the cocking piece lug rests in a separate channel, preventing the firing pin from ever reaching the primer. To ready the arm again, just pull back on the hook and turn it the other way. Now the cocking piece is back on the sear and ready to drop. Also like the Mauser, the two-tiered follower raises all of the remaining rounds. Once the magazine is empty, the rear of the follower rises to block the bolt, signaling a need to reload. Now, let's go shoot it.
<sighs> what an elegant little rifle. All right, now we try our hardest not to waste y'all's time with a repeat episode unless we have something new to share. While my honing in on the Monlicker influence is pretty neat, there is something else I'd like to add to this episode that we didn't get to do last time. That would be a carbine. Weighing in at 7.5 pounds and now only 38 inches long, this is way handier than the long rifle. Of course, it does still have a five round staggered box magazine feeding from a stripper clip, and of course using the same exact 6.5 millimeter smokeless cartridge. The Japanese army was well aware of their need for a shorter, lighter rifle, specifically one that was uh, side slung so that it could be carried on the back. Like so many armies, Oh, these were primarily focused on cavalry and other mounted troops. Let's go ahead and take a look at what they came up with. All right, this dandy darling is a lot shorter, although from the rear, you'd never know it was a carbine until we saw how short this rear sight is. Hmm. Because of the shorter barrel and the lower muzzle velocity, we are now only pushing up to 1500 meters marked on the rear sight. Also fairly ambitious. The front sight has actually received a protector woo, to keep it from being banged around and deformed. The protector itself is banged around and deformed. This would actually become common on later Type 38s and further Japanese rifles. The carbine is slung on the left side with a deep set spring for that barrel band and of course a big generous and slightly canted swivel for the upper sling position. And if we come down, we'll see our lower sling position is actually set, well, it looks like it's set just above that break point. And by the way, boy, can we see it clearly here. Look at the difference in the grain boundaries. Look at those two pieces of wood. I guess I should have borrowed this earlier in the show, but I wouldn't have been able to show you the lower sling. The upper sling, these screws are supposed to go through what would be the dovetail joint sitting from this piece up into this piece. So in theory, it is also holding them both together in addition to the butt plate screws. Well, screw here, screw up there. Another difference is here on the side. This bolt release is now perfectly smooth. Uh, it hasn't been recorded, but I believe there's potentially two reasons for this. One, the serrated one was more likely to accidentally get bonked and open up, or more likely two, uh, like the Dutch had problems with, this was probably rubbing on the uniform because it's on the slung side of the gun. And I can imagine it sawing right into a good old Japanese military tunic and therefore causing a lot of damage to a rider on many miles of riding. So smoothed on over. Returning to the front of the gun, this would have had a cleaning rod, again, missing from this with a brass tip, that out to here, it would have been shorter than the rifle one, but still possibly segmented with others. The other thing that's unique is the earliest of these would not have had this bayonet lug. That's because the cavalry were issued the Type 32 Co Saber. The large Type 30 bayonet would really just become a nuisance and was therefore omitted. Trials versions and likely pre-production Type 30 carbines actually lacked a bayonet log, and early manuals didn't include it either. However, it was soon apparent that other troops would be in need of a handier rifle, a transportation signal, etc., and they didn't have a sword in their way. So, uh, if literally only one type of troop didn't need the bayonet, it was probably easier to just leave the log on and avoid having mixed production. Really, there isn't much to say about this carbine that isn't covered by the rifle, but I think the handling is gonna be just a bit different, so let's let May take some shots.
Oh, <laughs> that's a darling. All right, full scale production of the Type 38 long rifle began in October of 1898. The carbines followed in August of 1899. They were, of course, made exclusively at the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal. Located in the Koshikawa district, this facility had been founded properly in 1870 and lasted until the Great Kanto Quake of 1923, after which it was materially rebuilt. The initial production of the Type 30, which is really the bulk of our story, would only be roughly 150 rifles a day. This would eventually double as the arsenal was expanded, though. The Type 30 rifles and carbines were produced in straight serial runs. No prefixes, suffixes, blocks, or tricks. So, from observed examples, we can get a rough estimation of total production. 554,000 rifles and perhaps 45,000 carbines. Certainly significant, but limited due to somewhat early replacement. In Japanese service, both rifles and carbines were marked the same, the 16-petal Imperial Chrysanthemum Seal, or Meiji Kamon. And below that, written vertically, 3, 10, year, type. In terms of actual service, the Type 30 would have a fairly narrow limelight. While it was Japan's standard infantry rifle during the Boxer Rebellion, the Japanese troops on hand were mostly Marines, still issued the Murata. Interestingly, a larger Japanese mission was supposedly halted due to concerns about Korea and Manchuria, both political battlegrounds for Japan and Russia. Following the Boxer Rebellion, China was forced to accept a two-year ban on importing of weapons, following which the Qing government would place orders for rifles in Germany and in Japan. So, in 1903, approximately 31,000 rifles would be ordered by the Qing government from Japan. These were named for the Guangxu Emperor, second to last of the Qing rulers. Now, this is a man with a very complicated history, but by the time of our story, he was essentially a puppet emperor, with the real authority flowing from the infamous Empress Xiao Qinshuan, the Empress Dowager Cixi. But of course, when ordering your arms, it's best to go with the name that's written on the official paper. Accordingly, the Chinese Arisaka would display the Manchurian dragon instead of the chrysanthemum, below which was written a stylized form of Guangxu, then the model number, of which there were two variations, the 29-year type and the 31-year type. These numbers represent years in the Guangxu reign, starting in 1875, but not quite aligning with the Edwardian calendar. The Type 29 seems to have been a direct clone of the Japanese Type 30 rifle, albeit with different markings. The Type 31, however, sports a Mauser export-style tangent rear leaf sight and wraparound handguard. It's supposed that the year gap between models represents a lack of supply due to Japan becoming embroiled in a year-long war. The lack of Russian withdrawal of its own troops from Manchuria, combined with some egging on by Kaiser Wilhelm, would lead to diplomatic breakdowns with the Japanese, and eventually, war. Fought in 1904 and 1905, Japan's victory shocked the world and it emerged as a full-fledged modern military power. Here, the Type 30 rifle was definitely the primary arm on hand and acquitted itself well enough, although much of the victory was naval. Japanese soldiers soon found that the 6.5mm cartridge, combined with a very long barrel, meant complete combustion of the available powder. That limited muzzle flash and made this an excellent sniping rifle that didn't immediately give away your position. However, there were some problems which we'll actually discuss in detail in our next episode. For now, you just need to know that the Japanese Navy would opt to skip the Type 30 for the most part. As for the Type 30, well, the army wasn't entirely happy either. They would replace it in 1906, and that's about as fast as you can get after that war was over. Thankfully, we already have a video out on the resulting Type 38, which also introduced a new Spitzer cartridge. Interestingly, despite remaining in service for some years, very few Type 30s would be adapted to this newer cartridge. You can spot a Type 38 cartridge Type 30 rifle by its modified rear sight. The 2000 meter marking is now on the right side and a bit lower. Falling into secondary roles, the Type 30 would still see some direct martial use in China and the Pacific through World War II, but this was very much the exception. It's far more common to find the rifles modified or marked for other special paramilitary duties. This particular marking was applied to roughly 10,000 rifles converted to smooth bore training configuration. These were blank fire only and marked Ku Ho Ju accordingly. More commonly, however, when pulled from army use, the Imperial Crest would simply be cancelled. 
For the Type 30, this was usually the stacked cannonball marking of the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal marked over the Imperial Crest. Non-army use could include various local government's enforcements divisions, uh, use as a training rifle for paramilitary education, or even being sold to another power. Some rifles have turned up with Siamese property marks likely being sold as surplus. And this is where things get really interesting, because Japan's first smokeless rifle, a flawed thing that lasted less than a decade in production, would soon find itself back in the fight thousands of miles from home. Which means we also have to take a quick trip. This is France, a powerful European nation with a world-spanning empire, who found itself embroiled in a truly massive war beginning in 1914. The Great War, which has so often been the focus of our show, would soon involve nearly every major power, on one side or another. And being a total war, where the entire industry of the countries involved was shoveled into the furnace, uh, the attrition rate on both men and material was extremely high. Facing the German invasion, French officials struggled to completely arm their troops, and were soon forced to issue obsolete rifles to their territorial reserves. This was the single shot Gras, not ideal, and frankly likely to inspire mutiny. Plus, not only did it not fire their standard smokeless cartridge, it didn't fire smokeless at all. It was a big bore black powder rifle of a distant, long forgotten era. Now, as we know from our series, the French would eventually convert these to their standard 8mm ordnance cartridge, while also ramping up production of their Berthier rifles and carbines. In the end, these would ultimately be the savior of the French front. Well, them and artillery. But before all that was secured, French officials were scrambling for modern firearms, and it was noted that the Japanese Empire was sitting on unused surplus. Actually, the surplus was precisely because Japan wasn't especially interested in sending troops directly to Paris, which had been suggested by the French and Russian foreign ministries. Well, if not the troops, some rifles would do, but France felt that the relationship between Britain and Japan was better than their own, and asked the British to broker a deal for them which was ultimately negotiated into 50,000 rifles. It's likely all of these were the more modern Type 38 at this point in the story. Manuals were even printed in French, but the rifles never arrived. Instead, once they were in British hands, another series of negotiations began. France would still much prefer to have troops and rifles, not just rifles. But the British were also having supply issues. So the Japanese Type 38s were traded to the British fleet, who in turn freed up standard short magazine Lee Enfield rifles, which were suitable for frontline army use. All right, so the Navy has Type 38s. Where do the Type 30s come in? Well, that's less clear. Apparently, once the British were manufacturing and issuing 6.5 millimeter Japanese ammo, they figured, why not stock up on usable second line rifles? In the end, they would acquire roughly 150,000 Japanese rifles of three configurations. The Type 38, known as the Rifle Magazine 0.256 inch pattern 1907. The Type 38 Carbine, which became the Carbine Magazine 0.256 inch pattern 1907. And an unknown number of Type 30 long guns, which became Rifle Magazine 0.256 inch pattern 1900. While the Type 38 would be listed as common to the Army and Navy, the Type 30 remained naval only. All right, so it was a naval rifle in the British fleet. Not a lot of chances for direct combat there, mostly just auxiliary roles like mine clearing. But the Type 30 would see much more action, and in a very bizarre twist of fate, this would be in the hands of its only real enemy, the Russians. That's right, by 1914, Japan's regional arch nemesis had become a strategic ally, and they were well short of rifles, so much so that in the summer of 1915, Russian Minister of War Alexei Polovanov would write in his own diary, rifles are now more precious than gold. It's estimated the Russians had upwards of 1 million available men without small arms. Having faced the Arisaka in combat and likely capturing some in the previous Russo-Japanese war, Russia was all too happy to get all they could in the face of staggering supply shortages. So they purchased every Japanese 6.5mm rifle they could, both the Type 30 and the Type 38. The flow likely began in 1915 and is believed to be initially focused on the Type 30. 
I've seen some estimations of up to 300,000 Type 30 rifles and carbines in total being requested. If delivered, that represents just over half of all the Type 30s ever made. I'm also unsure if this number includes or excludes a large number of British owned Japanese rifles, 128,000 of which, the large majority that is, would be shipped to Russia in 1916. As the British caught up on their own 303 production, these were of course no longer necessary. They represent a mix of Type 38s and 30s in unknown quantities. Estimated Russian use of both Japanese rifles ranges from the high 400,000s into possibly the 700,000s. Records are apparently very unclear. No matter where the number fell, it is easily representing the second most numerous supply of long arms to the Russian army throughout the Great War. Now, of course, we know that Imperial Russia didn't survive the conflict, suffering massive losses of men and struggling both politically and economically, its war front would collapse in 1917, erupting into civil war. At that time, a great number of Japanese rifles would then fall into the hands of opponents like Austria-Hungary, who would refield them in reserves. Many also ended up in emerging countries born out of the Russian ruins. One example being Finland, who not only retained the Type 30, but also added a universal modification. The Russians had found the magazine release too easy to bump with their gloved hands in cold weather, resulting in catastrophic dumping of the magazine during combat. So a spring clip was placed over the button, preventing it from moving by accident. I've also heard of Russians filing off the button head itself, but Finland apparently liked the first idea, and adopted it for all of their Type 30 rifles. From Finland, some 10,000 of these would go on to Estonia as aid, and of course, thanks to other surplus markets, we actually see the Japanese rifle emerge in a myriad of surprising locations around Europe. The Czech Legion uh, is another one of the recipients. Chinese factions during the Warlord years also seem to find quite a few of these guys, so on and so forth. Although, while we're on the topic of China, there is exactly one known copycat Type 30. Apparently, appearing sometime in the 1930s, this was a crudely made clone chambered in 8mm Mauser. It's believed it was made in Tianjin by a series of small factories for use by a Japanese-friendly puppet force. They are recognizable thanks to their cherry blossom crest. Alright, I suspect we've done a much better job of fleshing out Japan's first smokeless rifle this time. The one thing we're really missing is a deep critique of its failures. But don't worry, that's coming in the next episode. Thanks to, well, maybe an exotically rare little, we'll talk about that next time. But in the meantime, I think we should probably get over to May to get her opinion once more on the Type 30, after years of experience with other guns, and for the first time, the diminutive Type 30 carbine. All right, gang, once more, we've made room for May. Hello. And a long Japanese rifle. That it is. Now, we are all sorts of out of order on this one because we shot the Type 30 before. Yes, that many, was episode 29. Many years ago. <laughs> and then we did the Type 38. Yep. Uh, and that was way later. Well, not way later, but it was a little bit after. But I think it was, it was still very after. early. I think we did it on the same film day, though. Yeah, probably. Oh. And then we... Actually, no wait. I'll have to look at the haircuts because that's how I know. Even if I was wearing the same outfit, <laughs> there is a special that I literally don't know if it's been released or not because this Ew. is we're filming like a month ahead of time. It's true. <clears throat> but there's a special with a visiting YouTuber mm -hmm. who uh, owes you some audio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he owes me some audio. But while we're waiting on that, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's come out or not. But uh, we had to pull out the uh, Arisakas for that special as well. Yep. So you actually are fairly fresh on the Type 30 and 38, weirdly, because yeah. we had to bump them back out and play with them again. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of people might be watching this without having seen our much earlier, much worse episode on Type 30. The lighting was uh, not as great, but the sound <laughs> had gotten there by then, The glasses I think. were amazing. Oh, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's start from scratch, though. All mm -hmm. right. I know a lot of people who have experience with Type 99s, Type 38s, things like that. This is Japan's first smokeless magazine rifle. Ooh. They only had one magazine rifle before, and it was a Kropacek tube system. Right? Nice. So, as a new Japanese rifle, and we're looking at it, let's say you've never seen a Type 38, and we're in the sort of 1910 era, right? The uh -huh. sort of end of the smokeless adoption wave, right? Okay. What are we looking at? Like, just give us a tour of the ergonomics and what your impressions are. Well, um, this rifle does have a lot of length to it, but surprisingly not as much heft as I was anticipating. Uh, it's very thin. Definitely doesn't feel like it should be this weight, though. I, that is driving me crazy because I'm thinking, like, 
comparatively, maybe like the Mauser 1893, I think and there should be a little bit of extra heft to it. Because that's what it feels like if I were to just grab around in the dark. But it definitely doesn't, when you hold it up, it's definitely different. Yeah, let me tell you something. Something that IDs uh, a lot of rifles in old historical photos, right? I see this length and this half cut stock. Mm -hmm. I see a flat style ladder sight, right? Yep. I see the receiver come down to here. I see a bolt gap and then I see a bolt handle at the rear of the receiver. Mm -hmm. Almost. Right? right. And then I see this sort of butt stock shape and I go, oh, Mauser 1893 or 95 pattern. Right. And then I see that semi pistol grip stock and I go, Oh, uh, and then some subclasses start to come up, right? Sure. But then you look closer and you go, wait, no, this isn't a Mauser. No, because you if you look dead on that bolt too, oh, wow, that's so different. Yeah. However, when you pick it up, even let's say you haven't looked at the bolt though yet, uh -huh. you just think, oh, Mauser 93 or 95, and you pick it up and you go. Yeah, it feels nice. The weight's <laughs> off. And I think it's a couple of things. It's lighter wood. Yep. Obviously, some machining differences. And very narrow by comparison. <laughs> yeah, and then no stepped barrel. No. Uh, so you don't have a beefy barrel at any point. It's mm -mm. pretty much the same tapered barrel the whole way through. Nice. And so I think that makes it lighter. I don't know if that's what's doing it, but yeah. it comes off a lot lighter mentally, uh, even if it's not pound for pound, just the balance and the... Well, the balance yeah. on that is also pretty nice, too, because it's right here towards the back of the finger groove. Yeah, yeah. look at that, right over the receiver practically. For how long that gun is, that's very far. That's pretty dang good. Yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me of the Steyrmann Liquor 1895 straight pole. Yeah, we were handling that off sh show for a little bit there because you brought it up like last week for There's me. The, and the that narrow narrowness, that lightness to it, I think that gun's even lighter than this oh, one. Oh no, the Steyrmann Liquor is narrower and lighter than this. That's pretty cool. But this is pretty nice. Well, yeah, we're getting to <clears throat> cartridge and stuff like that. All right, so the gun's downright elegant in some ways. Yes. But let's keep going on the tour. So we've got mostly a Mauser-looking thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got your... Go ahead. Tell me the difference. you like the semi-pistol grip is in the right spot? Yeah, it really does feel like it's in the perfect placement. Like, it, my fingers, all three of them, fit up perfectly behind that trigger guard right there to pull me right into where the trigger needs to be. You cried out for that during the uh, Spanish 93, I believe. I did. And here it is. We have found it in Japan. <laughs> all right. That's perfect. For uh, you, though, you might be a little crowded on that. You might be wrapping around it. It feels it, better the, fit for a smaller yeah, hand. Yeah, the length of pull but is... But maybe, a, you know, Japanese man, smaller hand? The length of pull is surprisingly not too terribly short for me. It's just a shade short, which I thought it would be... Much smile. I guess I'm choking up on it now, but it's still not what I would call abysmal. Like I'm, I'm a little scrunched in, but I don't. I like how tight it is. Though. It'd be better if it was about maybe an inch further out, but that's still quite reasonable to me. I think it feels pretty good. Well, yeah, you're smaller. Mm, well, to be fair, you're the height of an average soldier at that time, which that's is true. still taller than an average Japanese soldier at the time. Yeah, and you don't have gorilla man arms, so <laughs> you're. Uh, I knew you're, I was missing something. <laughs> Uh, um, but yeah, no, so I honestly appreciate the semi-pistol grip, perfect placement, pretty good for me. Um, as far as the action goes, very smooth. I saw that, there was a lump. There is a little bit of a lump there because it's cock on close, so you're just going to have to push against the action a fair bit there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it is, and the problem is that I've shot the Type 38, so like I'm thinking, oh, it's not as clunky as that, but I can't do that comparison yet. We've got, uh, we've got one here, a little carbine with us. Okay, then, yeah. And so, I've got the dust cover off of it, but I've noticed, for my sake, you get all the way in with the Type 38 mm -hmm. almost. So let's see, how far into does that bolt go? It goes right almost up here. Almost as far. Yeah, almost. And I then, almost get to this little uh, ridge right here. I think it's a little further out than Type 38, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. And then when I get this final push right here, yep. I don't know why consistently on Type 30s it's felt smoother. Mm -hmm. This last little lump, feels like it sort of snaps over on the Type 38. Right. On the Type 30, I feel like I glide into it. Yeah, and I want to say the bin that you have right here is not quite as nice as this one is, no, as well, far as so, assisting me in that no, this round one's over. This one's weirdly better at assisting. You think so? Yes, the curvature starts earlier, and oh, okay. it's more shallow. So I think, especially with the Type 38, they must have had a lot of stiffness here, mm -hmm. and they knew it. So they went ahead and really focused easier. on helping you cock that. Okay. Whereas this one, it's like you get a little help right at the end, because it's only really where it stacks. It yeah, actually feels it's not pretty that smooth severe. to me. Yeah. Okay. But I did notice um, when actually working the two actions between the two. You okay? You yeah, just stack? putting it down carefully. Okay. Thank you. Um, I did notice that 
it is smoother feeling, but I, I can accidentally over rotate the bolt just a little bit to the left and cause some drag on the rail if I try. And it's just enough that I actually I can base, I'm putting significant downward force on that right now. This is actually pretty stuck for the bolt and it's only if I accidentally pull it a little to the left. Yeah, so if you're shooting in a hurry, if the adrenaline is flowing and you get on this gun anyway. and you accidentally crank down yep. or crank over to the left, mm -hmm. you start getting I mean, that's Some pretty practically severe. stuck. If I pull hard left and pull back, yeah, it's, it's not stuck. opening I know. until I come over to the right a little bit. Right. And I know that seems insane, but believe me, when you're trying out a new gun mm -hmm. and your nerves are going, I've seen plenty of people do it. That happened to me with the Ottoman Mauser. As, much, as smooth as that action is, I was actually managing to push a little bit too hard down at the very beginning of me testing out that gun, just enough that it was causing some binding in the action. Right. I was still able to free it, granted, but with this one, that kind of binding really is jamming it up pretty this bad. Is, this is honestly why you see some of the support lugs showing up in later Mausers and things like that. Okay. Um, because it's not, it's plenty smooth when used correctly and sort of in this neutral, easygoing way, mm -hmm. but that's uh, not always how it's used. Now the sights themselves, they're actually pretty fine. Um, well, mm. no, 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 they're not actually. I, <laughs> I was going to say, what are No, we that is about? a pretty deep set V notch right here for the rear sight. And those sights are really far away. I do wish they could have been yeah, closer Yeah, you got up. a V within an inverted V. Yeah, and yeah. a really tall barley corn front sight. And they're, they're to me, they're almost chunky. They are pretty chunky. I mean, chunky. they're not French chunky, but they're no, fairly chunky. No, that's what I was thinking. I was like, they're not Bertier chunky, no, but, but they're, well, those are like chunky, like square chunky. Um, there is a gentleman who's a fan of the Arisaka sites, although now I'm thinking about it, it might be the Type 99. Okay. So I'll stop talking about okay. it. Okay, well, that was a good story. Uh, yeah, it was That was Matthias' story. stories for you. Check out Nine Hole Reviews, but I think I just realized he was talking about the other sites. Okay. He was talking about the Aperture. Um, uh, and then safety. I found it's pretty straightforward. It kind of makes me think of like a Schmidt Rubin style where I had to hook the ring and rotate it. Mm -hmm. For this one, you have to hook the little hook, hook <laughs> not to be redundant, and then push it in. And I will say it, there is a little bit of a pinch Are you pushing? No, no, no. I, yeah, I'm just like letting it drop in. The problem is I wanted to make sure I was fully seated in that channel in there and I just kind of let it down gently, but there's a little bit of pinching that can happen right have, there. She has shell shock from the other gun. A that comes bit. next. A little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the it's hook not is unusual. A little narrow. It is. I wish it was a little bit bigger. Yeah. A bit a bigger hook would be better. Okay. And it is kind of like pretty narrow feeling, so unfortunately mm -hmm. it's not it doesn't feel great on my finger for operation purposes. All right, so we load her up, five yeah. round stripper clip, works yep. fine. Pretty straightforward there, yeah. nothing that unusual. Then we chamber. Mm, yep, and cock and, close, cock and close action, just mean it when you close it. All right, trigger, Yeah. which is dead on a Mauser trigger. Yeah. It's two stage, mm -hmm. but smooth. Yeah, it was actually very smooth. There's a long take up what feels like, but it's smooth all the way through. I get to a sudden heavy cliff that actually is Pretty stout. It is a pretty heavy cliff right there that you hit up against, but then you pull it through and boom, you're done. Yeah. Do you know it's going bang, you think? Huh? No, 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 no. The thing is, I can't really tell when it's about to fall off that cliff. Yeah. All I know is there's a small amount of travel into that cliff, and then there it goes. Mm -hmm. I found it to be superior to most mass production mouthers. Oh, yeah. that was. This is pretty... There's no real comparison between the two, I would say. It, uh, that smoothness, you can't escape that. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pretty Mesa good. Mesa significantly better. Yeah, I think it is okay. significantly better. So the gun goes bang? Yeah. Recoil? Recoil, 6.5 coming out of this thing? Yeah, that's like <laughs> nothing. That's like no, that's like peanuts. Come on. Like, I remember it being peanuts then, and I was I was smaller and couldn't handle it as easily. But now, yeah, it's peanuts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's such a mild 6.5, too. Oh, yeah. And it's just... Oh God, there's almost no recoil. Follow-up shooting's really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, the You're getting almost full powder combustion, so there's no real muzzle flash. Nope. I, frankly, I would love to shoot this long range. If, oh, if it yeah. weren't so hard to get the ammo made, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then of course the condition of the gun is, it's much older. Right. But uh, you know, taking a minty one of these and shooting some long range would be pretty fun to try out. I would love to be able to try that someday. Yeah. And we've got the range now to try it on. <laughs> Just need the ammo that's dialed into the gun, I yep, guess. Yep, there we go. Um, but no, that's uh, that's pretty much it for, for handling, for shooting. Overall, we're seeing some pretty good advancements here, I would say. I feel like... That ergonomically make it feel pretty dang good as a shooter. Are you telling me that in a pristine, clean environment, mm -hmm. you would probably rank this as more pleasant to shoot than the Type 38? In a pristine, clean environment. The Type 38 carbine versus this, you mean? Or no, the no, Type the 38 rifle. rifle? The rifle. Um, well... 
maybe not take it over it in that, because I know the safety changes. We go to that nice palm safety that's easier to manipulate. Is it? You kind of, we have well, old footage of you fiddling. I know, but you can't actually palm it. You just got to mean it. I just wasn't able to mean it as well back then. You're hedging. I'm going for this. Really? Because yes. you get a nice little dust cover with it too. The dust cover is annoying. Yeah, but it protects. All the things, Look at how much of this exposed from I all that said pris, wet sand. Pristine. Oh, and okay. You did say pristine. Target shooting. I'm taking this. I can yeah, manipulate the caulking. Good. Think about recocking this. Okay. If you have a bad strike, you just recock it. That's true. You, you don't can have to just do the opening yeah, closey okay, thing. Well. Like, well, what are we really else gaining from the 38 then for the rifle for the, the 38, advancements? The 38, and we haven't covered this, but we covered it in another episode. Mm -hmm. Much stronger. Okay. No double feeds. Okay. Practically mud and waterproof. Uh, we'll take the mud and waterproof off the table for the you moment. You can use the safety with a gloved hand because you just palm it. Right. Sure. So there's a lot of improvements in the 38. It's actually militarily, hands down, the 38's a superior rifle. Okay. But I'm talking about just for pleasant shooting. Just for pleasant shooting, um, I think the action was a little bit smoother on this one. So for pleasant shooting, for me as the shooter, that would have to win out. Yeah, this one feels just a touch classier, mm -hmm. but not for military use. No, for military use, the 38, the rifle itself would win. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, we have another one to talk about here. <gasps> no, what? Because really? this was a double episode. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, it's again. It's a small version. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Not not Gunsmith Mark. This is a different Mark. Yeah, different Mark. Thank uh, you, different Mark. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> that is he his name now. He left us Kirby in a hurry to help us get this episode done. Yes. And you... And that was one of those things where, hey, somebody said they had it, what, years ago? And you happened upon the email, and we were like, oh, we're planning on redoing the episode. Yeah, but I've called, Thank him, you again. called in that favor probably three years late. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but always Thank let you. us we know what you got, because you never know. True. So, uh, in this case, you had not actually fired a Type 30 carbine. No, I had not. You had actually only fired this in the type 44. 38. Yeah. And the 44. Yeah, 44 is rad. All right. <laughs> um, big question. Okay. If you were handed the gun loaded, lock, like locked, loaded, ready to go. Okay. And you didn't look at the gun. You just looked down the sights and pulled the trigger. Okay. Could you tell the difference between these two? No. Is that one missing the disc cover? I mean, it's missing. Well, the safety. Yeah, but I'm I'd, saying I'd don't. I see the safety. No, I'm saying you're not. You just look down the sights. Yeah, I look down the sights. And pull that the trigger. safety I'm is different. Oh, my God. You're ignoring the safety. That's the whole <laughs> you tell me to look down the sights. Uh, the whole point, though, is you're not paying attention to the Okay. Gun. You pull the trigger. Okay. Well, you're, wait, first of all, you take a grip. Does the grip feel different? Not exceptionally, no. No, the, that's a pretty much the same spot. If anything, that's a little bit, not quite as long for the finger groove. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't really think I would be able to perceivably tell the difference between the two off the bat. Okay. Then you pull the trigger. Okay. Is there a significant difference in the trigger? I don't think there's going to be, no. No. Okay. Then it goes bang. There's yeah. no difference in the lock time, really. Shouldn't be really any difference in recoil. There's almost no difference in recoil. Unless we're talking about, their, unless specifically you're shooting like the Type 38 cartridge versus the Type 30 cartridge, in which... Theoretically, there's a minute, minute amount. Of, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> no, there's not really a massive difference right. until like maybe I go to manipulate the action, in which case this smoother. one's smoother. But far more robust. Far more robust. You're so, in, in the long term, if I'm having to handle them, obviously I'd have to go with the the 38 carbine. Yeah, for combat. Yeah, for combat. But, but for pleasure, the, the pleasure. <laughs> So which would you rank between the long rifle and the carbine then? Well, the carbine would have to be superior. You always like the carbine. Well, the carbine is always going to be superior because it's I'm able to superior. shoot it longer. It almost longer. always is for me. This longer goes shoot longer. This goes further. Ha ha. Now this is one of the jokes. few cases in which the the rifle may be superior to the carbine. What do you mean? If I was in combat, I might choose the rifle. Oh, well, now we're talking about combat. I see how this goes. I That's what's always been the show oh, concept is that we're at war. Okay. We're at war. The range, you're definitely going to have more range with that one. No, this, this is puzzle time. To... Can you think? Can, other than range, can you can you, can you you figure it out? Why am I coming? You have home. Start guessing along. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Muzzle flash. Oh. Because this gun almost completely or completely uh, uses up all the powder. So there's almost no muzzle travel. flash. Okay. That gun. It is going to have muzzle gonna flash. It's going to light up the sky. That's true. So if you're I shooting... I would get found a little bit faster. Yeah. It depends. It depends. If I'm having to do trench fighting... Well, first of all, neither one of these is going to be great I do for like the front fighting. sight better, though. Uh, what? I oh, do just like... 
Because it's right there with the protectors. Yeah, it's pretty good. Like yeah. that's, I mean, don't, I can't see myself mistaking one of the side protectors as like the front side just because of the, mm -hmm. the height difference and the actual shape. I do like that front side better. I, I get it. Marching, digging, uh -huh. high, riding on a horse. At all the things that people don't think about when you go to like get on the car. It's like, all right, you got to have your water bottles. Yeah. Does everyone have tissues? Combat Emergency under, toilet paper. Combat under 300 meters. Mm -hmm. I get you. Yeah. The, you're right. Overall, for most yeah. people, better. Oh, yeah. But on rare occasion, when you want to take a shot and don't get found real fast. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Okay. You're not wrong. In your weird little scenario land, you've got your one scenario gun. If I'm thinking selfishly, just me and no one else shooting. Okay. This is the gun to shoot. That's oh, fair. If I'm firing in a line with other guys, I guess they're going to find me anyway. But, yeah, it's true. Yeah, but I mean, well, you say that, but even 30 guys, if there's no muzzle flash, it could take you a while to figure out where it was coming from. Yeah, that's fair. Well, he could hide up in a bush real good with this thing. Okay, that's what Athias is doing with his time then. He's hiding but, in a bush. I, hey, giving away your position's a big <laughs> deal. <sighs> but yeah, no, um, you're not wrong in your one little scenario. You got that one. <laughs> That's all you're but otherwise, the Type 30 car, the, the actual carbine itself does have to be superior in the other ways because I still got some decent range with this one. They still ambitiously have put me up at 1500, I want to point Ooh. out for my markup here. Ooh. I know. Ooh. Don't be jelly. <laughs> Plus, right. I still got that 6.5 cartridge. A lot of the ergonomics are pretty similar to the Type 30. Action is still smooth. The recoil is slightly more stout. That's realistically about it. Mm. And in better front sights, I think. I think the front sight's better. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it. That's all I got. Okay. That's fair. It's all a fair opinion. Yeah. All right. Well, then, I guess, uh, is there any final thoughts on this? Um, it's kind of sad to see the carbine go back home because uh, I do tend to enjoy these a little bit more. I'm happy the Type 30 will be Ow, sticking around. Me. I know. You're really bad at that. It did. It pinched me. I got fat fingers. <sighs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We it, appreciate it. My finger is actually larger in diameter than the scallop for the hook. Okay. And, like, it actually hurts to use a little okay. bit. Okay. All right. It's not uh, even 3 a.m. and he's already doing uh, this, I want to point out. Thank you, everybody. Have a oh, good that's evening. Easier. My right hand's better. <laughs> All right, bye. <laughs>